So today, let's talk about asses and bases again. Let's finish off some of this idea. Probably we'll get through three today. Ask me questions. I can go as fast as I want. The, you are the handbrake. You are the people who put the brakes on. If you ask me questions, we can slow down. We can take our time. We can talk about the information in more detail. Uh, otherwise, I just fly through. What I started talking about on Wednesday was this idea of this little um, acronym that the book uses, A-R-I-O, to decide what's, what are the prevailing sort of features for um, acid-base chemistry. What are we looking for here in terms of ideas and properties and concepts that will allow you to solve acid-base problems. By the end of today, uh, we'll, we'll be done with the chapter and I'll show you some fairly complex problems that will definitely be on that test. You will always get tested on this on the first exam. Uh, the idea of atom, what are we attached to? Are we attached to oxygen? Are we attached to carbon? Does that make a difference in terms of the acidity? Yes, it does. What is the size of the atom we're attached to? As we head down the periodic table, if they get bigger, the bonds get weaker to hydrogen and the anion becomes more stabilized because you can spread the charge out. Resonance, you should be okay with resonance. If not, soon, like today. Um, I need to be gone by two today, so if you need to find me, do so before two o'clock. Uh, resonance delocalization will help stabilize anions. That contributes to a stronger acid. We've got to be happy with this backwards and forwards relationship and the converse relationships between acids and bases on, on two different sides. Induction is a different one. We haven't seen a lot of that before. Uh, the idea of electronegative elements will have something to say about acidity and something to say about how you can spread charge out so that we can talk about um, relative stabilities there. And then the orbital, the hybridization does make a difference. We can see that very quickly. So I'll, I'll just go through these again very quickly uh, and we can hopefully um, see what's going on. The atom makes a huge difference. Okay? The atom makes a big difference. The electronegativity of the atom attached and the size of the atom attached. As you go across the periodic table, as the electronegativities increase, it looks like the acidity increases. The pKa's drop and so the molecules get more acidic. And this is to do with two factors. How positive is the proton we're attacking, and also how stable is the charge when you make that charge. So in this example, very straightforward, we can see here that the difference is a C versus an O, and you don't want to put a negative charge on the carbon just yet. Next semester, if we make the molecules more elaborate, we will be able to do that, but right now, no. Uh, what's the pK of this bond in a, in a butane-type molecule? 50. I asked you to learn the pKa's. If you didn't, good luck. Uh, what's the pK of this guy on the right-hand side, an OH group? 16, right? So that's a big difference. This is logarithmic. That is a huge difference. You know those numbers. You have something tangible to get hold of and to be able to use in exams, on exams. So the idea here is the charge is better stabilized by the more electronegative element, and the proton in the acid is more positive because of the more electronegative element. Uh, going across the periodic table, that's a general trend. So you, you work your way uh, down the rows. It'll be the same idea. So in this case, CH bonds are very, uh, they're not acidic at all so far. HF is quite strong because of the electronegativity difference. Uh, if we head down the periodic table, we're still talking about the atomic properties here, the atom we're bonded to for the hydrogen. And we can see now that the, um, the concept is, is a little bit different. It is no longer to do with the electronegativities because the electronegativities are dropping off as you head down. It's now to do with the weakness of the bond or the strength of the bond, and also to do with the, um, how you can spread the charge out. Now, this is not delocalization in the same sense it is for resonance because we don't have any pi bonds. But you can still think about the bigger the atom or the bigger the ion, the, the better it is to spread out that charge. So S minus is, is bigger. It's more stable than OH minus, so it's a weaker base. And conversely, that means the H2S is a stronger acid. We talked about uh, trends there. That should be fairly straightforward by now. Again, ask if you're not sure. Resonance is absolutely important. Uh, we've had some good questions in the office hours this week about resonance. We spent some time in, in recitation. Again, Monday's class, you don't have a recitation next week. So your job is to come and find me, get some uh, problems worked out, because the week after is the exam. Ethanol versus acetic acid, they both contain OH groups. They both contain a related functional group. But we now recognize that this guy on the right, having this extra carbonyl, is a big deal. It will withdraw electrons. It makes the proton more positive, And it also stabilizes the negative charge when you produce it. So on the other side, when we draw the conjugate bases, this one on the right is way more stable than this one on the left. And that's manifested by the different numbers. What's the pKa of this proton on ethanol, roughly? 16. What is this functional group over here? Carboxylic acid. What's its pKa? 5, approximately. That is a big difference. It's logarithmic. So that carbonyl makes all the difference in terms of stability of the conjugate base and also acidity of the proton. So those factors are fairly straightforward uh, in terms of um, things that we've dealt with. And you can see what's happening now. The material from 2 is leading into 3. The material from 3 will lead into 4. And you can't forget these ideas. They, they are always important. Uh, induction. This uh, sort of obscure one that you haven't seen much of. Those electronegative elements are close enough to the functional group, to the acidic place, to make a difference. So this electron withdrawing chlorine is going to pull electrons away from the neighbor. That neighbor will pull electrons away. And ultimately, it's the hydrogen that loses out. 
I've said several times, I'll say it again, an acid-base reaction, and when you're considering what's going to happen, you have to consider both sides. You have to consider the acid, and you have to consider the conjugate base on the right. Is the acid acidic for whatever reason? Is the conjugate base on the right stabilized for whatever reason? That will lead to, to acidity. So in these types of examples, if we look at the proton on the top, this is more positive because of the electron withdrawing chlorines, and down here, this is going to be a little bit more stabilized because chlorine can help pull electron density towards itself and away from this oxygen. So in that molecule, there are really two things happening, resonance stabilization and induction, one on top of the other. You'll see that resonance is through pi bonds and induction is typically through single bonds. And they both add up and they both help, stab help stabilize the system. Ashley, any questions? Michaela, where have you disappeared to? Okay, carrying on. The one that people tend to forget about is this idea of the orbital making a difference. The hybridization pattern on the carbon involved with the CH bond makes a huge difference. How big a difference? Well, that's half my scale, 25, right? 10 to the 25 difference in terms of their acidities. So we, we reckon over here, what's the hybridization here? SP3, what shape is it? Tetrahedral, what are the bond angles approximately? 109 and a half. And if I jump over to the one that's on my scale, this one isn't on my scale, this one is, uh, what's the shape of this molecule? Linear. What's the hybridization pattern of the two carbons involved? SP, absolutely. Uh, we'll now see that the uh, proton here is way more acidic than the proton on the left. And that's because of the fact that you have SP hybrid carbon there versus SP3 hybrid carbon on the left. We say that SP hybrid carbon is more electronegative than an SP2 or an SP3. The more S character you have in the orbitals involved, the tighter the charge is held. It's more electronegative and so therefore more stabilized. So this is somewhat related to the first thing we did with the atom, but obviously we're, change, you know, we're not changing the atom here, we're changing the electronegativity of the atom by changing its hybridization. So you'll find as we work into the later chapters and we start using these things, it is quite straightforward to take off that proton. You need a strong base, but it can be done, whereas you can't take off these protons because they're not acidic enough. That's where we left off. So we've got some overlap from last time. There's your list. Use it as a checklist as, as, if you like, the people who are keeping up with this stuff and, and are, on, are on target, uh, you will probably won't use it as a list. You'll see the obvious factors. That's resonance. That's the atom. That's the size. It, as you practice, that becomes more obvious. But there it is as a checklist, and, and use it as you see fit. Anybody got anything to say? Go on. So these are order of which... That's according to the textbook. I, th I quite like this because otherwise it's a bit nebulous. Where do all these factors come from? It's a nice job of organizing it so that you learning it can have something to grab a hold of. Yes, absolutely. So the atom is usually the one that's most important. And then you've got to worry about, okay, I've got oxygen here and oxygen here, so it can't just be the atom. It has to be something extra like resonance or com uh, inductive effect, stuff like that. Yeah, but that's a good place to start. Ashley. That's right, that's right. Based on the fact that the resonance hybrid and the actual conjugate base for the first one you talked about with two oxygens is more stabilized. Yeah, that's right. So everything's coming together. Uh, this is going to get more interesting because of that, but also more challenging. Now, what we're going to do here is lead up to actual problems, lead up to setting up acid-base problems so that you can solve them. This is as difficult as you want to make it or as straightforward as you want to make it, depending upon your input. Uh, I have a system here in which later on in the class, I think chapter nine, when we get there, we're going to take off these protons from alkynes and use the product to do something else. We're setting up a, a subsequent reaction. So I have here a proton with a pKa that you now know is about 25. And I have over here ammonia with a pKa of about 38. So they both can be acidic. And we've, we've mentioned this several times. It's the environment that counts. What is the environment we put this thing in? Sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll add a base, sometimes you'll add an acid, and then your job is to work out what's going to happen afterwards. So in this thing, uh, I, can, I can argue that this can be basic. It has a lone pair. I can argue maybe this thing isn't basic because it really doesn't, at this point, have a lone pair. Uh, but I can think about trying to take this proton off. And if I use ammonia, ammonia is a fairly weak base. It's neutral. It's not very reactive. And typically, when we want to make something more reactive for acid-base chemistry, we take that proton off. If we can remove that proton, the conjugate base, let's say, of NH3 is going to be highly reactive. How do I, how do I know that? Well, the pKa of the acid is 38. Is that a strong acid or a weak acid? That's a weak acid. So what does it tell you about the strength of the conjugate base? Very strong, right? So if you want to try and do this type of chemistry, you've got to consider the conjugate bases. Maybe the job we're trying to do here is take this guy off. I can't use this. It's just too stable. It's not reactive enough. And so what we can think about now are the conjugate bases. pKa of this is 25. That means this is a strong conjugate base. 
But since the PKA, this is 38, this is a much stronger conjugate base. So on the problem set I sent you from chapter 3, which is buried in the, in the course pack, but I sent you it as an individual file, read it this weekend. Have a look. Do some of those problems. You'll see how it takes off into the, the whole two semesters. From now on, acid bases will be fundamental. It will be very important uh, almost every day. So I can see here a very reactive species based on the fact that it has a really, uh, really weak conjugate acid. So this is going to be highly basic. This will also be highly basic, but now I'm in this dangerous place where I'm comparing. They're both strong bases, but one is stronger than the other. I know this because of the conjugate acid pKa's, and that's where we need to be. So we might set this up like this. We might argue later on that we need to do a job. We need to set up an acid-base reaction so that we can make this stuff. And this stuff on the right is what we need to go further in the chemistry. This is one step. By the end of the next semester, we'll be doing 10, 12, 13 steps. There is a problem set on my website for 3720 with a 38-step reaction that you have to have a go at. Right? 38 steps is challenging. This is the beginning of that. So I'm looking here at a pKa of 25. I recognize that as a what? A weak acid or a strong acid? A weak acid. So if I want to take that thing off, what do I need? A strong base or a weak base? You need a strong base, right? And we'll find out very quickly if we learned anything in freshman chem. This idea of equilibrium, this idea of thermodynamics and energetics, all comes out now. If you didn't, we need to get that worked out now. So I can't use NH3 because it's just too weak. If I take off that proton somehow, and I make NH2 minus, which I can, I can buy this reagent, I now have a very powerful base, which is powerful enough to do this. So I'm going to take my lone pair, I'm going to form a bond to the hydrogen, I'm going to do an acid-base reaction, recognizing that the hydrogen already had enough electrons, and therefore I must lose a couple and send them to carbon. This is okay because that carbon is SP hybridized, it can handle that charge. On the right-hand side, I get my conjugate base from my alkyne. This guy will be very important later. And I get my NH3 as my conjugate acid. That conjugate acid you know is a peak, has a pK of 38. It's very, very important you know those numbers so we can actually use them. If you don't, it's pointless. So in this example, we're starting to ask this question, which side is favored? If I do this, do I get a situation in which my starter materials convert completely to product? Or do I get a situation in which it just doesn't work? They just don't see each other and don't like each other? Or do I get a mixture? Do I get an equilibrium? This is going to be a big deal all the way through. These arrows now are suggesting that it might be an equilibrium. Well, in any equilibrium, you know, usually one side is favored. It's rare that you've got a mixture where it's exactly the same on both sides. So I'm using terms like starter materials. These are the pieces I will take and put into my reaction flask, the materials on the left. And I'm using terms like products on the right-hand side to try and build into reaction mechanisms that are not simply acid-base reactions. It looks like my weak acid or weaker acid is on the right, and my stronger acid is on the left. It also looks like my weaker conjugate base is on the right, and my stronger conjugate base is on the left. If that means nothing, you've got a weekend to get this organized. It needs to be in there. It needs to be comfortable. So the right-hand side is favored, as it says. This is, should be fairly obvious. Which is more stable? This C minus here on an SP hybrid carbon, or this N minus? The right-hand side is favored. C minus, right? We're suggesting that this is preferred. That's preferred. You look at the strengths of the acid. You have the stronger acid over here. You have the stronger base over here. Don't forget from freshman chem, strong acid plus strong base gives you products. NaCl plus, sorry, NaOH plus HCl gives you water and NaCl, right? Strong acid, strong base, the right-hand side is favored. So you are starting to look at the comparison between the acid strengths and the base strengths on both sides so that you can come up with a, an argument. So there's an example. That's what we need to do now. We can start thinking about how this works. It can get as complicated as you want. This is, I put this up because I think it's kind of intimidating. It's sort of daunting when you look at this thing. This is something, if you can handle this, you should be fine with acids and bases. It is a very, very subtle question dealing with compounds that look almost alike. But again, in, in the careers that we're looking to do here, things look alike. Your job is to differentiate things and explain things to other people. So I have an acid, and I have a base. And they react simply by this base going after that proton. You know, there's nothing fancy here. There's just a couple of arrows in the same sense we've been doing. And that gives me a conjugate base and it gives me a conjugate acid. Well, the job now, not knowing anything about pKa's, because you don't know the pKa's of these things, you don't need to, is to think about the concepts, to think about what's more stable on either side, to think about what's stronger on either side. Now, I've got two negative charges here, one on nitrogen and one on uh, nitrogen over there. 
But the difference is, in one, you can put some charge on sulfur, and in the other, the charge can go on to oxygen. Where would you rather have a negative charge, on a sulfur or on an oxygen? Sulfur, why? It's bigger, you can hold on to it, one of our concepts. So it turns out in this material, this is preferred, right? This is preferred. So that means what? What does it mean about the acids? If this is preferred, if, S, if this guy here is preferred, which is the stronger acid, the one with the oxygen or the one with the sulfur? The one with the sulfur, because its conjugate base is more stable. So now we'll see at the bottom, you don't know these numbers. I'm not going to ask you to learn those numbers. They're obscure. If you needed them, I'd give you them. You want the main ones and the key ones that I've given you. You can now put together this concept. You can put the products together. You can put the numbers together. And you can decide what's going to happen in terms of where the equilibrium lies. And in this case, it goes to the left. You mix the two materials on the left, some of them go to the right, they come back, they go backwards and forwards. Don't forget an acid-base reaction can come backwards because you made a conjugate acid and conjugate base when you did the reaction, and they can go backwards and forwards. So now I've got this idea of where does the equilibrium lie. Engineers, what is K for this? Greater than 1 or less than 1? Less than 1, because the left-hand side is favored, there'll be more of it, and so the equilibrium constant now is going to be small. It's going to be less than 1. This is what we need to do, and this is where we need to go. Anybody want to say anything? You'll have lots of questions next week. Over the weekend, uh, you can email me. I'll answer back. Uh, if you've got problems online, take a screenshot, put it in the email, and that works quite nicely. Uh, don't email me Monday afternoon or Monday evening, because the bug guys are playing. Other than that, fine. Uh, here's, a, here's a problem. Now we have to start designing things. This is where organic chemistry starts to take off, and where my class is different to other people's classes here, because I demand that you're able to design things. I demand that you're able to know how to use things and put things together. It makes it more fun, makes it more interesting, but hey, it makes it a hell of a lot more challenging. It starts now. There is a problem in chemistry that doesn't happen in biology, because in biology, what is the solvent all the time? What? <coughs> Sorry, water. It is water, and it is protic. It has a proton. It is acidic. What is the pKa of water? 16. It has an appreciable pKa, which makes it a, a medium, sort of moderate acid. Well, that's a problem in the organic lab. In biochemistry and biology, it's all been sort of put together to, to work with that system, to work with water. Not in the organic lab. It's very rare that we can use water as a solvent in the organic lab for many simple reasons. Many of our molecules are just not soluble in it. Like bisols like, and many of our molecules just aren't like water. They're not polar. They're nonpolar. So over the years, many solvents have been developed to allow us to get around that problem. We've developed all kinds of different solvents, such as the ones at the bottom, hexane, and the one at the bottom, which you'll see a lot of, tetrahydrofuran, which allow us to dissolve our organic stuff up and do a chemical reaction. Because you have to have some medium, right? You have to have some solution to work in, or else you can't do this stuff. Well, the problem is, and this is, this is labeled as the leveling effect, is that if you choose a solvent for an organic reaction with strong bases, you can react with the solvent. And that's usually not what you want. So the idea now is that we've chosen a, a, a solvent here, which has an appreciable pKa, and we're trying to use this reagent like we did on the last slide. It won't work. You haven't seen this yet, but you will. In the organic lab, when you start a chemical reaction, you typically go get yourself maybe one gram of a, of a substance, maybe a powder. And you put this one gram into a flask. And then you might add 25 milliliters of a solvent. You have a huge amount more solvent than you do of your material. OK? Your material's dissolved up. You have a, a, a clear solution that you can see through. And everything's dissolved up. But if you now add something that is basic, and your solvent is acidic, you've got a higher chance of going after the solvent than after your reagent. So we have to be very careful. We have to design the experiment appropriately. I can't use this solvent for most of my organic chemistry. It's not compatible, and it's acidic. So we choose solvents like this. There are no acidic protons on that molecule. What is the pK of this proton at the end, approximately? 50, not acidic. Fine. This is limited because it's nonpolar. What if your reagents are polar? That's where we go later in the chapters, where we start to des uh, design solvents that have intermediate properties. They're a little bit polar, a little bit nonpolar, and they work. Tetrahydrofuran is very good. I could argue delta plus on this. I could argue delta negative on that. And so that is going to dissolve up an awful lot of material. So this leveling effect means be careful which solvent you choose, because the solvent might react. You don't want that. Fairly simple. Now. Some little bits and pieces before we start practicing some problems. Uh, there are some slight differences in pKa values. If you use the, the sort of graduate level pKa table that we get from uh, the Evans group at Harvard, which is like the universal go-to acid-base chemistry, uh, acid-base sheet for, for uh, graduate school, 
uh, you see very slight differences. And those very slight differences mean something when you get, for example, to biochemistry. Tyler, you, take, you took biochem? Detail, right? I mean, detail beyond this stuff. And subtle differences, very subtle differences that then dictate biochemical, biophysical, whatever you want to say, biosynthetic outcomes. So we're learning to deal with that detail. This guy has a pK of 18. It's an alcohol. This one on the right, which is more typical of what you've seen as an alcohol, has a pK of 16. Two, two units difference. If you're in high school, two units difference means nothing. If you're going to medical school, pharmacy school, CLS, any of these subjects, engineering, those two units mean a big deal, right? That's 100. That's a power, two powers of 10. That's a big deal. So there is something different here that makes this less acidic than your typical alcohol. And a lot of it is to do with this material here. Okay? This material here is bulky. We did a bit of this before. You start making your molecules more spherical, they run into some problems, right? They have lower boiling points because they can't, they can't actually see each other. They can't come next to each other and start to form uh, intermolecular bonds or intermolecular attractions. And this is somewhat similar. When you put an acid and a base in a mixture, in a solvent, you want them to dissolve. We'll find very quickly that if you have a liquid and a solid, and they don't dissolve, they won't react for the most part. Yeah? They won't react. They need to be dissolved up. It's like in a swimming pool. You know, if you jump into a swimming pool and there's no water, what happens? It hurts, and you don't have any fun. But if there's water in there, you can start swimming around and finding things. It's fun. So that water is the solvent. You need to have that solvent in there to do chemical reactions so molecule A can find molecule B. In this example, we are doing something called solvation. We are dissolving up the product. We've made this material in the solution, and we need to make sure it dissolves, or else it's not going to do anything further in a, in a subsequent reaction. So the problem is that it's more difficult to dissolve this up than it is to dissolve this up. It's again to do with the idea of the size of the thing, the shape of the thing. The solvent here has a, has a more difficult time actually attracting to the negative charge. You think about what a solvent might do. It might help stabilize that negative charge by maybe hydrogen bonding to it. Yeah, something simple like that. It's trying to help stabilize that and trying to dissolve it up. So it turns out linear molecules like this with no branching are easier to dissolve up. And so solvation effects here starts to lead to a very subtle difference in the acidities of these two things, which, as we work through the, the two semesters and head into things like biochemistry, two units is a big deal. Yeah, two powers of 10 is a big, big deal. There's also something a little bit more to it that we haven't seen just yet. But we'll say later on that these groups are actually the opposite of the chlorines. They actually push electrons towards carbons, right? Instead of being inductive effects in this direction, they actually push electrons towards things. Now, if you push electron density towards a negative charge, towards a negative charge, is that going to stabilize that or destabilize it? Destabilize it, right? It turns out this t-butyl group is going to do that more than this group over here, and so that's going to destabilize. We're not quite there yet for that idea, but it's something that adds up to this guy being less stable than this guy, which means this is a weaker acid than this one. You've got, three you've got five days without organic chemistry. No, you haven't. You've got five days with organic chemistry to get ready for Wednesday because we're into chapter four. Okay. We've mentioned this in the past. I'm just going through the sort of order of the book so I don't jump around as, as, as can be very annoying. Um, my sodium here doesn't really matter. As a chemist, and certainly a chemist who's, ha you know, we have to deal with big molecules and big systems, and sometimes there's too much detail that is, is not needed. So in this example, you look at the bottom. There's the sort of general chemistry approach to this, where you put NaNH2 plus H2O, and you get NH3 and NaOH. Well, at the bottom is my organic chemistry type of interpretation of that. I've got some bonding patterns. I can see where things are. I can see where my lone pairs are, and I can see where my charges are. Uh, I'm doing a chemical reaction that involves NH2 minus going after water and picking off that proton. And on the right-hand side of this, I get my ammonia, and I get my hydroxide. What happened to my sodium? Nothing happened to my sodium, right? It did not change. I'm interested in chemical change. My sodium didn't do anything. And certainly, those of you who are taking this leap from freshman chemistry into the graduate, I said graduate, into the, uh, the um, sophomore class, the, the organic class, those of you who are really on top of this stuff, you'll ignore the sodiums. Those of you who are struggling a little bit, you're like, where's my sodium? Because you're not quite getting the point, right? You need to get that point to save yourself hassle later. So you put them in, great. You don't put them in, great. Yeah? In freshman chemistry, maybe it's like, where's your sodium? No points. In my class, I don't care, because it didn't change. 
Not happy with that? Ask me later. Now look at that at the bottom. I've got a situation that is very simple. It's a freshman level type of uh, equation. But we can work out now whether the right-hand side or left-hand side is favored. What's the pKa here in water, approximately? 16. What's the pKa in the conjugate acid on the right, approximately? Silence. 38. OK, 38. Which one of those two is the stronger acid, the left or the right? Which one of those two is the stronger base, the left or the right? Left, the other right. This, isn't, this is funny, but it isn't, because this is a significant idea. Which side is favored, left or right? The right-hand side is favored. K is greater than 1 or less than 1? Need to do this now. So we're wrapping up. I don't have an awful lot left in this chapter. I just have some examples to practice before the end of today. And I don't want to start four today because I want to give you a chance to get three organized. This is going all the way back to freshman chemistry. You might have done this, or you've seen it done, or you've seen the consequences of this, where you have water and you add HCl gas. HCl is a gas. You bubble it through water, you make hydrochloric acid, right? And everybody knows that if you do this, it takes water as the base. You know that water is amphoteric. It can be either an acid or a base. And the lone pair from water now goes after the HCl. And you've got this problem now because both can be acidic and both can be basic because they both have lone pairs. That's experience. That's common sense. All of a sudden, HCl is not going to become a base. Yeah? There's nothing magical about this stuff. It's all con consistent. So I've decided this is the base because uh, this is by far the stronger acid. And I know that if, it, if I dissolve up water in HCl, I will get conversion into H3O plus and Cl minus. Now, what's the peak of, of H3O plus? Negative 1.7, okay, negative 1.7. Do yourselves a favor, or favors, and learn the pKa's so that you can use them. We'll find now that this is favored to the right-hand side a lot if you think about the consequences of that in the lab. What do you think? Does it get hot or cold or stay the same temperature in the flask? It gets hot because it's exothermic, it gives off heat, and that's, that's the manifestation of that. So now we've decided that a Lewis base I'm sorry, sorry, a Bronsted uh, type base has lone pairs and a Bronsted type acid has a proton. But you have to get into the organic world quite quickly. And this can be confusing. Not all acids have protons. You're used to this world where everything that's acidic has a proton. Not necessarily. We're going to use lots of things like catalysts in which we need to do some sort of complexation reaction to make something more reactive, but it's an acid-base reaction without protons. It's an acid-base reaction without uh, hydroxide, stuff like that. So in this example, this was on the first quiz, I think, and I got some good questions about this in the office. Uh, what shape is that thing, the BF3? Three single bonds, what is it? Trigonal planar, what do you think the hybridization pattern is? SP2, we'll never get that one wrong again, right? It's always, it's there now. So what's the, what the issue is here is that there's a fourth valence. It does not have eight electrons. It can happily exist like that, but you put it in the presence of something that has a lone pair, it will complex with it. So in this example, that's an empty p orbital. The fourth valence is an empty p orbital, which is available to be sort of coordinated to. And this now is accepting electrons. And as we go through four and head into five and six, and we start doing actual chemical reactions again in six, we need to be happy with the, the <coughs> Lewis definition of things. What we did so far was pretty much Bronsted Lowry. Now we're talking about Lewis. And Lewis is far more encompassing than the other definitions. In this example, the base is an electron donor. Okay, that kind of fits the same pattern. But in this example, we're not talking about protons now, we're talking about electron acceptors. So any of the metals you've dealt with, with a positive charge, they can be electron acceptors, things like that. That will become more apparent as we go through, but you need to know that definition so that we can start talking. Okay? Now, I left, or I started the lecture, or the chapter, with this slide. And it's worth going back to it now because You've had a chance to get into this stuff. You've had a chance to learn some functional groups and some PKAs. And we can again start to realize that we know a lot. We've actually got quite a, a lot to say about these molecules quite quickly. If you look at this system, what is this functional group over here? Carboxylic acid, what's its PKA approximately? Five. What is this functional group right here? Alcohol, what's its PKA approximately? 16, absolutely, and over there as well. You know about shape. What is the hybridization pattern on that carbon? SP2, what is the hybridization on this thing here? SP2, what is the bond, the sigma bond between those two atoms from the homework and the quiz? What is the characteristic in that bond? What atoms are going into making that bond? 
Well, what I'm talking about hybridization patterns. SP2, SP2. A lot of people miss that, right? This atom is SP2, this atom is SP2. That means the hybrid orbitals they express into space are being used to form that sigma bond, because hybrid orbitals always give you the sigma bonds. So if you're asked what type of bond is that, it's between SP2 and SP2. It's fairly simple. Phenylalanine. You'll see a lot of as an uh, amino acid later. What type of functional group is this? Aromatic or, the more modern term is arene. What is this? That's an amine, right? It's not an amide, it's an amine. And what's the pKa approximately? 38. And on the other end here, what's that? Carboxylic acid, pKa, 5. So after two and a half weeks, we can look at these things now and say a lot. You'll be amazed after the first exam how much you can get out of this. You can see an awful lot of detail in these things very quickly without having done any chemistry yet. Right, here's a difficult one, morphine. Uh, what's the pKa of that guy right there? Be careful. 10, good. A lot of people, especially the slackers, we don't like slackers in my class, right? Especially the slackers will say 16. And what do you get for that? Boom, boom. <laughs> the big red slacker pen. Don't be one of those people. Conversely, what's the pKa down here? 16. What type of functional group is that? That's an alkene. What about this one here? Somebody said it. Ether. Good. What's this over here? That's an amine. That's an amine. You're on top of this stuff. We'll be friends. We can do this forever. What's that? What's that buried in there? Amide. And that up top. Amine. This one right here. From there to there to there. What's that? Ether. Right? So we're in good shape. You're on top of that stuff. Great. Now, to finish off my last 20 minutes, I've got some examples. Again, this is what we do in recitation, except we haven't got recitation next week for the Monday class. You want to help? Come and ask. You want interpretations? Come and ask. You want to ask questions over the weekend? Email. A lot of the time in chemistry, and especially in biochemistry, people tend to reduce things down. They tend to abbreviate things, which can be a bit of a nuisance. Uh, what is the functional group in that molecule? Carboxylic acid. Yes, it is. So you very quickly have to interpret that in your head as one of these molecules. What's its pKa approximately? Five. So we know that. We've decided now, OK, there's, there's not a lot to give away here. The one with the metal is the base. The one with the metal, because potassium here has what charge? Please don't get this wrong. Yes, it is a plus charge. So that means the atom next to it, the oxygen, is a negative charge. And how many lone pairs does negative oxygen have? Three. So I simply have something like this, R, O, three lone pairs, and you've seen that many times before. So if I do my acid-base reaction, where negative goes after positive, and we take this thing off, we produce the conjugate base. Written a little bit differently, but that's life. That's the way it's written sometimes. And on the right-hand side, we have a conjugate acid. What's the peak of this guy on the right-hand side? 16, yeah? So very quickly, what I've done here is set up a situation in which I've got some numbers. I've been given the products in this case. I'm going to give you an example in a second for an exam. We're not given the products. You have to draw them. And you have to decide which side is favored and what K is, greater than one, less than one. So in this example, which side has the weaker acid? The right side. Which has the weaker base? The right side. Why is the right side? Why is that a weaker base than this, using the basic principles? Delocalization. The charge is delocalized in the carboxylate where it isn't in the O minus in the alcohol situation. So which side is favored, left or right? Right hand side. Is K greater than one or less than one? Greater than one. That thing I sent you by email yesterday, I think will be a great help. Read it, be happy with it. So you can see here, that's the job. But this is the first job, right? It's like building a house. You know, what we're doing so far right now, we just dug the hole. There's an awful lot of stuff to do before you get a house at the end of 3720. PK of 5, PK of 16, that tells you an awful lot. It tells you an awful lot about the base strength as well as the acid strength. And it can make, allow you to give an, an opinion on which side of the equilibrium is favored. This is not easy, but if you practice, it becomes so. Things you haven't seen before. You know, real world, you've got to deal with things like that. In this example, uh, which of these two materials on the left is the acid? The thing on the left, right? That proton on the left. What's its pK approximately? 25. I was thinking of using those buzzer things, you know those clickers? Yeah? To see how, what people know, but it just wouldn't work. I'd probably get the electrified ones. 
<laughs> and if you got it wrong, you'd be like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> Apparently that's illegal. Anyway, uh, the one with the metal is this one. The one with the metal is the base. And so what's next to it is an N with a couple of lone pairs, and it's negative. You can look at that and, you know, panic. Then, then this isn't going to be much fun. Or say, all right, I know something about this stuff. I know it's a negative nitrogen, therefore I know it's basic. I know it can go after my proton. It can take it off in an acid-base reaction, because guess what? That's all we've done so far is acid-base reactions. When we've done 126 other reactions by the end of 3720, you'll see how straightforward this was. I'm going to get on the right some conjugate base and some conjugate acid, and I need to put some numbers in. I did 25 on the left. What's the PK of this thing here, approximately? Pattern recognition. It's an N with an H. What is it? 38. Okay, 38. Now, 25 on the left, 38 on the right. Which is the stronger acid, left or right? On the left. Which side is favored, left or right? Right-hand side. That's all there is to it, but... Big red slacker pen people are going to be uh, in trouble because they don't know those numbers and they haven't practiced enough to get over the barrier of recognizing the structures. That's all there is to that. If you're given the products, you're usually not given the products, that's the problem. Next one. All of a sudden things got ugly, right? You know, I've got my chem draw, I've got my program, I can draw what I want. I can make the molecules big and ugly, I can put giraffes and elephants and whatever else you want over here and just make it a big, ugly organic molecule. Your job as a trainee scientist, trainee physician, trainee engineer, whatever, is to realize, oh, you're just being silly, Norris, and that's got nothing to do with this, and focus in on the business part of the molecule. Now, again, people who are not quite in tune with the way we do this stuff, and they don't have the study discipline, will look at that thing and they'll tell me, that's a PKA of 10. And I'll say, no. And you'll go, why? And I'll go, because it isn't. Why isn't it 10? It's too far away from the phenyl ring. It's too far away from the benzene ring. That's detail. That's easy to get lost in. That's the level we're at. So what's its pK approximately? 16, not 10. Now over here, I've got a metal that suggests that we have uh, lone pairs on the O, three of them. It's negative. That's your base. So then you go ahead and you take this and you go after that proton. You take it off. Uh, second arrow to show that. And we're left with this. And guess what? 88.7% of that molecule did absolutely nothing. Okay? None of this did anything. That's a challenge. That's what you have to do as we get better at this. Now, let me get rid of all that nonsense. Uh, what's the PK on the left? What do we say? 16? What's the PK on the right? Approximately 16. What do you think K is? Approximately 1. And that leads to a very interesting situation now, because you have all of this stuff in the flask at the same time. In 3720, we have to consider the possibilities with five, six, seven, eight different species floating around, looking at each other, going, you know, we're going to react or not. It's challenging. So that's that, right? That's if you're given the products. Your job is to give the products. So the last thing I've got to say today is to think about actual problems from exams. And on my first exam, there is always a page of this stuff. Sometimes it's worth 16 points, sometimes it's worth 20 points, but it is always there. If you know it's going to be there, what should you do? Study this crap, right? Because it's going to be there. So on this example, we've got three acid-base type problems, and your job is to give me the products, and then label each acid with an approximate pKa, and then tell me whether it is complete or incomplete. What does that mean? Well, that's part of that problem set I sent you, deciding when things will go all the way to the right, or not, whether the reaction is complete or incomplete. So we'll spend a few minutes on this. Uh, top, what is, the, um, what is the pKa of that molecule on the left? 10. And how do I know this is a base? It's got a metal, and so that metal is positive, and therefore next to it will be my three lone pairs on my O, which makes it negative, and so my acid-base reaction is in that direction. So that your first job is to draw the products. How do I know what the products are? If you understand what the arrows are trying to show you, you should be able to get the products quite easily. Because the arrows are showing, forming a bond between O and H. So on the other side, I should have H, O, CH2, CH3. Because guess what? An acid-base reaction is a proton transfer, so far. So transfer the proton. You then end up with, you know, bits of spaghetti, shrubbery, whatever you want to call it, that didn't do an awful lot. None of this seems to have changed. The change is now here, 
where I have three lone pairs on my O and I made that negative, and I'm not going to even put the potassium in because I don't feel like it. And I don't need it, right? I'm busy, I've got other things to do. So, we're done with the products. That's how you get them. Now I've got to worry about PK. We've already said 10 over here. What's the PK on the right? 16. Where is the stronger acid, left or right? Left. Why is this a stronger acid than this? Anybody? They're both hydroxyl groups. Shouldn't they have the same PKA? What can I do over here that I couldn't do over here? Resonance, delocalization. Absolutely. Much better, strong, much better conjugate base, meaning a stronger acid. So again, stronger acid, stronger base, which side is favored? Right-hand side. Now, we've got to be careful here. That certainly will be significantly to the right. That reaction is going heavily to the right. 10 to the 6 is a big difference. But you could always argue that is a little bit coming back. It is when you have a massive difference between pKa values and base strengths that the reaction goes in one direction completely, and over here does not react again and come back. Something you have to pick up. So I've got that to work on. Now, next one down. Which of these two molecules is the acid? The one on the left. What's its approximate pKa? 16. So I'm trying to work out the problem on systems I haven't seen, you know, some bits and pieces here. You put, you put whatever you want here. It doesn't really matter. All right? It's just the fact that we have a hydroxyl, no double bonds, so no carboxylic acid, it's an alcohol, and I've got a methyl, so I'm going to put negative charge here, and that means we're ready to go. So what does my arrow start to suggest how this reaction works? On the negative O, the lone pair, where does it go to? Proton, right? It goes here. Why not go to one of these CH bonds? Not acidic, not polar, fundamentals. We go after that proton, we take it off, we put the charge onto the O minus. Draw the products. You draw the same skeleton, and then you put the charges where you need to. We will hammer this stuff. If you're not in recitation on Monday, you're welcome to come to Wednesday's class. And you're welcome to come ask questions in office hours as much as you want. And Tyler, you have a session next week? Several. Several. Okay, so make sure you take advantage of that. I'm going to draw my spaghetti because it didn't do anything. I'm going to put my charge on my O because that's where it's gone. And I'm going to transfer my proton because acid base reactions are proton transfers on that guy over there. Simple enough so far. So on the right hand side, what's the approximate pKa? 16. So which side is favored, left, right, or neither? Neither. So in this case, we can legitimately write that arrow because this is a base, and that's an acid, and it will do the reverse reaction. So in this reaction mixture, you've got all four things. You've got some of this, and some of this, and some of this, and some of that. That can be good or bad later. So in this case, neither side's favored. We did not completely deprotonate. What was K for this, approximately? Approximately 1. Fun stuff, this. Down at the bottom. Things you haven't seen before, but that's life. What's missing from here that should probably be on there to make this look like an acid-base reaction? Uh, hydrogen. Okay, we don't put them in, but you need to make sure it's there. What's its pK approximately? 25, good. Now over here I have a metal. That suggests that on the adjacent atom we have a couple of lone pairs and it's negative, and there's my base. And so my base comes with... There we are. And we take that thing off and we end up with an acid-base reaction. So on the right-hand side, the hydrogen ends up on the N through a proton transfer. Got one lone pair left, it's neutral now. And I end up with this piece over here, which has lone pair and negative charge. What happened to my lithium? Don't care. Right-hand side, what's the pKa approximately? 38, pattern recognition. So which of those two is the stronger acid, on the left or on the right? On the left. Which is the stronger base, on the left or the right? On the left. So what, which side is favored? The right. OK, greater than one, less than one, bananas. Greater than one. So this is a good place to leave it, because I'm done with three. And your job is to make sure that you are done with three. Have a nice weekend. See you on Wednesday.